Joining us right now, I'm really excited to have this guest on. Edward Stringham is the president of the American Institute for Economic Research. We frequently have guests on from AIER because they are brilliant, especially Jeffrey Tucker, at articulating a message of small government and liberty. Those two things are inextricably linked, so I mentioned them together. If you want to talk about liberty, you have to talk about small government. If you want to talk about big government, you're not talking about liberty, except that you're against it. If you're promoting an expansion of government, you're promoting unliberty or something other than the American system of government. So I'm excited now to get into this, especially in this moment when government is uh, is seeing a crisis that it can't let go to waste. Joining us now, Edward Stringham. Hello, sir. Hello, hello. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you for taking the time to join us. So how did you get to be such an illustrious character? You get to run such a brilliant organization as AIER. Well, I got my PhD in economics in 2002 and been uh, publishing various articles since then, publishing in the Wall Street Journal, publishing a book with Oxford University Press called Private Governance. And the goal is to get economic literacy out there to as many people as possible in math. We and what is what, what does that mean? What's what's missing in the average American's head? That in yeah, terms in of math, uh, we have economic to, literacy, uh, we have to study things and realize the relationships between numbers. And the same thing is true with economics. Sometimes it's intuitive, but sometimes it's not. So something as basic as as the importance of prices and the problems of price control. So right now, when we need more uh, medical equipment, if price rises, that will create an incentive for the manufacturers to produce more. Or there are people on Amazon uh, and eBay with a large supplies of of um, hand sanitizer, and they say, okay, well, how can we ration them? We can start selling them at higher prices. It turns out that a lot of local politicians say, no, this is bad. You can never raise prices, especially under these moments. And when that, that happened, happened right here in Connecticut, it, it, it happened just a couple of weeks ago, that same thing. There was a gas station selling uh, small, I think, two and a half ounce little uh, containers of hand sanitizer for 10 bucks. And and the attorney general went on the rampage, and I said on the air, "This is good. These we need more people who are making available to us something that nobody else is selling. Everybody's mad at the people who are selling a product instead of mad at the companies that don't have it." Right, right, exactly. So you have the high price actually let it go to the people who really need it, such as the hospitals. If, on the other hand, the price is kept artificially low, people might say, oh, I'll just buy this extra stuff, just have it sitting around. And so price As in actually, toilet paper, right? That's what happened with toilet paper? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that's a funny one because I think that one is pretty clear. The, uh, we hope the uh, paper companies, the uh, paper companies can reproduce toilet paper very quickly. Uh, but some of these other ones, you really need to make sure they go to the uh, highest value of use. And in the case of the N95 masks, it should be going to the hospitals. And if the price is kept too low, then you've got regular people buying it up and the people who really need it don't actually have the opportunity to buy it. It's funny, even after you explain that mechanism to people, that because it is fairly obvious once you hear it, okay, if the price goes up, fewer people will buy it recreationally. And toilet paper is a good example. People go into the store. As a matter of fact, I was asking someone who worked, we had a caller who works in a grocery store last week, and I said, what's the story with the toilet paper? And he said, the story is that people come in and, and we get a supply that comes in, a small shipment, and the people who are in the store immediately call all their friends and family who rush down <laughs> to buy their own. And it, would, if they doubled the price, which the attorney general would think was somehow evil, people would think twice about stocking up rooms, empty rooms with toilet paper they don't need. That's exactly right. And we can see the same thing with 
uh, gasoline, uh, around hurricanes, where certain people who just don't necessarily need that gasoline right away, they'll, they'll fill up their truck and make sure they've got a few months of gas uh, sitting around. And meanwhile, people who actually really need that gasoline to get out of town are left without it. So this is an example of economics being counterintuitive. It helps people coordinate their behavior when you allow flexible prices. When you have a price control, on the other hand, it leads to shortages. And that's what we need to be teaching the world about, in my opinion. We're talking with Edward Stringham. He is the president of AIER, the American Institute for Economic Research. Regular guests on the program, his people are. And uh, they're so much fun to have on because they illuminate things. They make clear the the things that aren't clear. One of the things people have really been tricked about uh, during the modern era, Edward, is to not realize that when there's a new government program, it means there's less money in the hands of normal people and more money in the hands of politicians. And it's kind of funny because I think, in general, Americans spend a lot of time and energy distrusting politicians. But as soon as a politician says, oh, you have to give us another X number of dollars a year so we can pay for you to do this. They think somehow they're benefiting. How do we benefit when government is taking money out of our hands in order that it can give us something? You're exactly right. So every program has a cost. It has to be paid by taxpayers or whoever, uh, whatever government debt, which is future taxpayers. And when the government spend a billion dollars, it basically prevents the private sector from spending that billion dollars. So nothing is free. There's always an opportunity cost. And the more that the government spends, the less that we have. And so a lot of times people think, oh, well, it's free. So that means it doesn't cost anybody anything. Well, no, the real cost is the opportunity cost, the cost of those resources that are now not being able to be spent by individuals, by private citizens. And the question that I always ask is, should you be able to spend your own money or how do you think it's going to be better spent? If you can spend your own money or some bureaucrat or some politician spends your money on your behalf. Yeah, it's really, uh, it's worse than that though, because if the politicians are making the spending decision, not only are they making the decision on your behalf, they're not even interested in the best interest of you or the other people they're buying it for. They're just using it in order to solidify their hold on power. Exactly. So pork projects, they uh, in many cases are, are rewarding people who are going to support them in their campaigns, uh, very special interests. The people, the groups who have the most time to lobby the government are going to be really first in line to be getting this political handout. And meanwhile, the average person who's busy in their private lives, they're not going to have the time to be spending lobbying at the government each day. So in, in reality, the average citizen is not like they're getting something that, oh, wow, I'm really grateful that this program is coming about. And in many cases, it's just going to a select few people, the, the, the cronies, we might want to call them. Yeah. We, we, all of our tax dollars are now going to fund cronyism. So this has me particularly nervous about the big relief package, two plus trillion dollars coming from the federal government to, to make a big splash in the states. It seems to me that if the Democrats, so we, they're the ones I'm most concerned about, even though I know Republicans are no bargain either, but Connecticut's been dismantled and destroyed economically on a, on a state level by, by the Democrats who've controlled the state for decades. And the idea that they're going to get a $1.5 billion splash of money flowing through their hands, that has me a little nervous as to what they're going to do with that money. That's a lot of election rigging money, it seems to me. Oh, certainly, yeah. It's going to go to the politically connected people, the people who have these pet projects that they've been wanting to fund for a long time. And uh, instead, why not let, let the private individual keep that money. So part of the stimulus pack package, which I don't think is, I'm not an advocate of, but it's not quite as harmful, 
is just saying, okay, here's this tax rebate or this loan that's going to get repaid, fine, whatever. I'm not a fan, but fine. Uh, the other ones where you're giving out free goodies to various politicians, it's assuming that those goodies are going to stimulate the economy in a way that wouldn't be the case if it was left in the private sector. And there's this term called the broken window fallacy in economics. And the idea is that when governments spend something, they're injecting money in the economy. And the critique of that is that simply it's taking money out of the economy that already would have been spent privately. So, and, and they're putting it into a place that, in my mind, is usually a debtor place to put the money. The money has less vibrance because it's going to stop uh, democracy and democratic values from being pursued and going instead or in, into system rigging. So anytime sure. we can yeah, keep money so, out of the hands of the system riggers, that's good. Certainly, yeah. So, you know, I am I live in Hartford, so I'm super excited about a baseball stadium, but the market actually was already speaking and saying it doesn't make sense to spend all this money on this baseball stadium now. And the market said we shouldn't build this stadium. And the only way that it could get financed is if the government basically said to the taxpayers against their will, you are going to finance this baseball stadium, whether you like it or not. So it's diverting resources from projects that individuals, consumers already decided uh, was not a good idea, and now it's diverting it to this program that, that, that the market would not have built. So the opportunity cost of this yard goat stadium is the millions of dollars that are not being spent in higher value uses. Yes, I love that. If we could get people to comprehend these basic, simple things and wake them up to that. I think we'd be a much richer society as a result in every way. Yeah, I mean, we're always trying to, quote, spend our way to prosperity. Well, who's, whose money is it? And, and if, if we're taking that from the private se se sector, we're making people poorer. We're actually wasting resources. So to think about how there's nothing that's free. We have unlimited wants. We have scarce resources. And the question is, who should be in control of directing those resources? Under socialism, under various lesser forms of socialism, the government is in control, saying, oh, we should do that, we should do that. Under markets, in contrast, the individual consumer gets to decide, I would like a red car please or i would like this particular type of television or this particular uh, meal this type of restaurant and letting an individual direct his or her own resources you know that that person is going to end up with something that he wants or she wants instead of giving this to the government who then in many cases just gives it to some big wasteful corporate project, this cronious project, and we're left with something that nobody actually wants. Edward Stringham is the president of AIER. It's American Institute for Economic Research, AIER.org. Edward, thanks for taking the time to talk. Let's do it again soon. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir.